front of it or ramped up so that the water stays on the floor. Um, if you put loads of computer floor in, you're great because obviously there's always a boatload of um, water space for that to get soaked up into. On that as well, it's worth noting that if there's a big area on the floor, there's more than one firefighting lift required. Yes. And the clever yeah. bit is to design the firefighting lift so it doesn't sit at the end of the building, never being used. Yeah. But to actually make it useful in the design, that's the, that's the tricky bit. Mm -hmm. So often you go into a building, there's a firefighting lift at the end, never gets used, comes to use as an emergency, surprise, surprise, it doesn't work. <laughs> If you can't do the, the grating for the sort of lift lobby, is the um, sump in the bottom of the, the lift? The sump shaft? in the pit is a requirement yeah. anyway. Okay. okay. That is an absolute requirement because obviously any water ingress that yeah. does get in needs to be pumped out so that the pit doesn't fill up because mm -hmm. there's pit switches and different things, lift yeah. electrical components in there. Um, the ramping is the simplest option. Just lift the doors up a couple yeah. of inches to try and stop that water ingress. But ultimately, there's going to be a, com a point where the, the building's flooded anyway, and it's going to be going down every orifice that it can, whether it's the fire escape so route. You can't just rely on the ramping, you still have to have a sump. You've got to have a sump yeah. no matter what, yeah. That's well, the actual sure. pump is now under the regulations on the ceiling of the lift side of things. The actual stipulation on the pump is no longer required. And one of the <coughs> ramp sound, that ramp's landings yeah. is actually no longer statute to have a pump. Because this is again the same situation where the pumps are installed, massive expense, and when they come to be used, surprise, surprise, the seals yeah. are dried out, and they, you know, they didn't work. That's part of no good, yeah. Do you, do you see many where you get the drainage still in the lobby though? Do you get many architects be able to do it in the lobby area? Um, we used to get quite a few in London areas where they went to the trouble of putting in the lobby, but now they put the emphasis purely on the lift shaft. We haven't done any that I could recall where they've made us do it um, but we if, if you're into somewhere in central London I'll be quite honest if it's something that's high rise if it's into that sort of stuff they'll be just talking to the big boys purely and simply. I've never come across I've dealt with some high rise buildings it's generally because the architects are so wrapped up in the aesthetics of things mm. they kick off about a ramp that's <laughs> long yeah. now, so what we have done before now is actually put a gull gully inside Actual lift itself, yeah. so that the water caught as it goes on the shaft. Yeah. So, there are alternative ways to do it. The way, yeah, the, it could be collected underneath the, the, the entrance, underneath the sill. It, it'll cost them a fortune to have it made, obviously, from the bracketry and all the rest of it, but it could be done for sure. Yes. So, we'll whiz past all the lobby stuff. Mm -hmm. How does the um, ramp on the landing comply with the document on the floors? Accessibility and level access and whatnot. Down to the architect to sort it out. At the end of the day, gradients. Gradient, yeah. yeah. Down to the architect to get it sorted out. You're only looking somewhere between an inch and two inches maximum. That's that's generally all that's needed. Yeah, I'm just thinking an inch or two inches in, an inch or two inches, probably too much of a gradient. Oh, yeah, no, no, you, you're looking over a couple of, somewhere between two and three feet, generally, I would say. Um, you can do it across the entrance to the actual thickness of the wall. It's not, you know, what, you're only going to be 25 mils around. So if, you, if your walls are 500 wide and you've got a 25 mil ramp, it's, mm. it's generally acceptable. It, it, you, you would be you would be difficult to notice it if you weren't consciously looking for it. You probably wouldn't even notice it was there. And generally, okay. Um, so yeah, a little bit more about BS double nine double nine. It picks up uh, whether any of you saw it. So that was 71. That was 76. And then obviously all these little tabs here, what comes in with, with anything on evacuation lift and, and double nine, double nine. So it picks up a lot more um, about the requirements and the needs of, of what we should have and what we shouldn't have. Obviously it's an old presentation, so 81, one and two are now gone. Um, 76 is the bit that I just, I just don't like it at all. Aims of the document, reduce the risk to persons in the lift car. Reduce the risk to persons being trapped in the lift car. So why have you said a single power supply is good enough then? Bit of a contradiction there, chaps, I'm afraid to say. No. So secondary power supply. Conflicts between 99 and 76, as I've said. Communication system, two-way comms, lift car. That's the important one. So architects say, oh, well, we don't need it, or we've got our disabled refuge stuff and so on. Guys, sorry, you've got to go back. We need it. It's part of our lift regulations. We couldn't sign your lift off as an evacuation lift if you don't have the comms for the lift. 
they want to seem to uh, to overlook it. So I think the main difference is are the comms for the re refuge unit, which are commonly for some stairs. There's no communication between that point and the lift car. Some fundamental differences on or the exit point. Well, the exit point. Yes. The, the, the <laughs> fundamental point on our evacuation is it communicates to each landing yes. on the ground floor yeah. and the lift car as well. So the ground floor can control where the lift car is. They can tell the lift car go to level five. You got people waiting there. Yeah. People level five can also do it. An interesting point as well is that what we realised recently is that lots of these evacuation points on floors are actually not DDA compliant. We've got a bit of a battle recently on one of two of our projects to make them because what is our tactile yeah. where it says call mm -hmm. and there's no induction loop. So somebody's up there who has got you know, a visual impairment or hearing impairment that she actually won't be able to use them. They press the button, but they can't yeah. actually hear the guy saying what floor are you on. Yeah. And they'll luckily very well, they should be able to know what floor they're on. That's true. But they won't know how many people are there. Yeah, they won't know the number of people there, but they will because the system will tell them at the, at the master station. What floor is calling? Yeah. So you can naturally assume there's somebody there for, for rescue. No. Wonder how many times that actually gets done. The evacuation lift should be tested at least once a week. I don't think it happens. No. So a few bits that we're going to come through. Um, <coughs> somebody mentioned the static system earlier on that they just put in. Um, alternative mains fed generator supplies. UPS battery backup. And the reason the battery backup one comes in is that's our eco cell lift. Um, so if you saw the numbers before, it's about 3k more rather than 20, 20 30,000 in space and all sorts of other bits and pieces. So. so, as I say, that's where my good lady wife works, doctor surgery, funnily enough. The doctor's reception is up here. About 12 weeks ago, three disabled persons in reception, all in wheelchairs, Collie monospace lifts, fire alarm goes off, lifts go bye bye to the ground floor. Nobody's been trained on evac, nobody's got anything to do with the evac chairs. What do we do with these three people? So they've spent, I think, just over four million quid on that building. I'd estimate the monospaces were about 70 grand, so 1.75% of the budget. Two of our eco cells would have been 90k, 2.25% of the budget. We could have evacuated them without any problem whatsoever. But for about 15 minutes, there were receptionists, secretaries, doctors running around like lunatics trying to decide what was happening. My answer back to the practice manager was I would refer you to the fire regulatory reform of 2005, Part B and all the rest of it, go and have an interesting discussion with the primary care trust design team. Because nobody asked my wife if she'd be prepared to put somebody in the back chair and have the humiliation of taking somebody down, or that individual having the humiliation of being put into the back chair and being taken down. We need to train in them. Disabilities are ranging so much now. These wheelchairs are so specialist Generally, it's discouraged to use the evacuation chair because you're not guaranteed to be picking up a person that you know, is comfortable being picked up by an untrained person. Mm -hmm. Funnily enough, what do you think was the first thing that happened the day after? One out of the three put their claim in. <laughs> so they're already facing some form of claim for their treatment in the event of the fire alarm going off. So, um, Kings, I'm going to just whiz through these guys just because I know we're getting close to time and I want to go through questions and things for you. So, Kings of School was just an existing lift that we did. We built that shaft on the back of it. There's the lift, there's the generator that we put in, there's the um, conventional traction unit that we did rather than the gearless machine and so on and so forth. Our eco cell lift, as I say, it's a simple solution from a point of view of this is the bit that's the cell, which is why I'll run through it quickly. Um, for an evacuation lift. What is it? 